Welcome. We're so glad you are all here with us tonight. If you're joining us online, it is so good to see you as well. Um, welcome to Lifehouse. We're just going to start off with a few songs. If you want to stand and we'll jump around and have fun. Yee, yee that's right. <laughs> oh yeah, this is a newer song. Um, so the words will be on the screen or on your phone, tablet, computer, whatever you're watching on, and sing along. It's pretty easy. I won't forget the wonder of how you brought deliverance, the exodus of my heart. You found me, you freed me, held back the waters from my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah, you have led me through, the led me through, yeah. Cloud by day is the sign that you are with me. The fire by night, a guiding light for my feet. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the water for my release. Oh Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me. Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. You stepped into my Egypt and you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom into the promised land. Now I will not forget you. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You stepped into my Egypt, and you took me by the hand. You marched me out in freedom, straight into the promised land. Now I will not forget you, God. I'll sing of all you've done. Death is swallowed up forever by the fury of your love. You're the God. Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah. You're the God who fights for me, Lord of every victory, hallelujah, hallelujah. You have torn apart the sea, you have led me through the deep, hallelujah, hallelujah.
sing worthy. And worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. In Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Oh, holy, there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me it is they shall put my trust in moan and I be shaken up my eyes. Worshiping you and, and learning more about Before we get started, think about this. I want you to think about this. Uh, teaching on the church at Laodicea this weekend. On tonight also, this uh, time at 6.30 p.m. in the choir room or 6 o'clock. So our choir has been back, and so, you know, praise God that, that he has shown himself faithful as we're getting through this and taking steps to one day where we're not going to be talking about COVID anymore, anymore. So we're looking forward to that day. I praise God. We received a call from someone earlier this week, another church here in town, saying, can you show us what you're doing? Because we're thinking of reopening this week in the next couple of weeks, and so Praise God, we, that's something way in the past. And uh, God's been faithful to us as a congregation. So, and you're very thankful for that. Um, uh, you notice we have uh, prayer requests. And, and if you have any prayer requests, please let us know. We have birthdays uh, that are coming up this week. And you see them listed on the front cover. Uh, we have people in the hospital. It says Ton Kaiser, but it's really Ron Kaiser, right? Yes. Ron Kaiser and Gene Wheaton and Shelby Lynch and Pastor Bobby. I know you visited the hospital. Do you have any updates? I tried to get through to them, but uh, they were busy all day last week. But Ron is a heart cath. Ron Kath, Ron Kaiser is going to be having a heart cath and asking for prayers. I was able to talk to Gene Wheaton's husband yesterday, and she's doing remarkably well after her surgery. And Shelby Lynch. 
Um, I, I only got to talk to mom, but really didn't get any information there. So I want to be in prayer for them. Yes. Okay, so Ace and Lydia Greer's uh, granddaughter, Callie Rose, having surgery for an elbow today at Shands. So, want to be in prayer? Yes. Did I see other hands up? I thought I saw a hand or two. No, I was, y'all were just, yes, there we are. Okay, so we'll be praying praying for your boss. Um, yes, Don. I, we need to find, Don needs to find a home for two wonderful cats. There's a male and a female. The most loving cats. And they need a home. Just any of you online that are watching and you're thinking, I just need, I need some companionship. It's two for one, BOGO at Don's. Okay. He, he's, he, uh, those of you online, he's, he is extolling the virtues of the calico and tiger marshmallow loving cats. So anyway, they need a good home. Right, they need a good home. So we're going to be praying for them too. So uh, God, is, God is blessing people and, and there are also people in need. There are health and special needs there in our prayer sheet. And uh, if you're not here, you can always pick one up on the weekend. They keep some at the welcome desk. Uh, we have those that are recovering in homebound and assisted care. We want to pray for those and, and missionaries and those that are on armed services. So uh, a lot of a lot of people we want to be praying about. I do know that if you are someone that's looking for a vaccine, they're going to be giving away 400 vaccines at the State Road 16 campus on Saturday. And if you get the weekly email, you can get the link to uh, sign up for that if you'd like to do that on Saturday morning. I'll be getting my second shot tomorrow, so you may want to. You may have already gotten yours. So Just you just go. Where do you go to the hospital? Get a shot at the hospital. Uh, let's go, to the front desk. go to the front desk, the welcome desk, and say, "Hey, do you have any vaccine shots?" And they will point you, jab you to the right direction. Okay, there you go. Hey, yeah. Any anything else? Any of the prayer requests you want to share? Okay. Can I just tell you, God is good. He is good. He's been good to our church, and I'm just so grateful for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, I thank you so much that you've been watching over us, Lord, as church, that you've shown us blessings in a remarkable, Lord, hard time. But, Lord, in this time, you've, you've shown us what it means not to trust in the strength of men, but to trust in your strength, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we do trust in you. Lord, I thank you for the steps forward we're making. Lord, I thank you that, that everything that is good is coming from you and from you alone. And, Lord, I ask for blessing. Lord, I do ask that uh, you would heal those that need healing, those that, um, that have surgeries coming up, those that are having surgery today, those that are uh, having health decisions that have to be made. But, Lord, also I pray for those that have not made a decision to trust in you. Lord, the hardest sickness we know is that sickness of our heart. We're, uh, we're, not, we're not in line with you. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here watching this, whether it's in, in real time or maybe in a recording, and Lord, they don't know you as Lord and Savior and the beautiful things that you do. Lord, may they know your strength, your hope, your beauty, and your love. Lord, uh, in, our, in this time of worship, Lord, make your presence known. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Why don't you stand with me as we sing one more? There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. 
your presence I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the atmosphere your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be over, Lord. Your presence, nothing can compare. Just, we, we weren't evil kids on, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but we, but you know, we were, we were definitely, um, not exactly how they happen. I think the stories have grown and grown and grown and grown. But one of the stories comes from a time my older did in the early 60s, 1960s when I was a little kid. And they're just all bright white. And me and my sure bright red. So we started writing all over. No matter what they did, they'd paint. And that lipstick would just bleed through. Okay? And they'd pen up. Usually when we were, uh, when they were, in the house, and we were in the house, we made lots of noise, but for some time we had just been real quiet. And when the kids are quiet, you got to watch out because that's when the kids are into trouble. So, uh, so anyway, uh, no matter what they did, they tried to cover it and lips to kept bleeding through. Well, you know, that, that's kind of a, a, a good analogy of our sin. You know, we, we sin, and sometimes no matter what we try to do, we try to cover it up, it still bleeds through. The consequences still bleed through. That's, that's kind of what Jeremiah is talking about in this passage. Have you ever made the mistake? Uh, you, there's this dry erase board, okay? You have a dry erase board, and you pick up the wrong marker. You pick up a Sharpie. You've done this, Lisa, right? And you write on it with the Sharpie instead of the dry erase marker, okay? And you think, and you then you try to wipe. It's not wiping off, and you got to... You got, I think there are chemicals that will do it, but like, it like melts the dry erase board, you know? Because, you know, you, you, you took that Sharpie and you sinned against the dry erase board. That's really is, is what that is, the sin against the dry erase board. Well, it doesn't erase. Well, the point is this. Sin doesn't erase. Sin doesn't erase itself. We can't erase sin there's only one way sin can be erased, okay? Um, and it leaves an indelible, you know I say indelible? An indelible mark, not just on you. It leaves an indelible mark on the people around you. It leaves an indelible mark on, on creation. So we're coming to a place in Jeremiah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 7. I could have pulled chapter 16. I could have done chapter 18. That's the potter in the clay. I mean, I could have done that. In chapter 19, he takes a, a piece of uh, uh, actual hard pottery and just sort of breaks it. I could have done that. It been dra dramatic. But decided to go to Jeremiah 17. And, and uh, it's talking about how Judah, the nation of Judah, has been so marked, uh, just indelibly engraved uh, with sin. And as we look at it, it's talking about the nation of Judah. But, you know, we can apply this to our nation. We can apply it to us as church. We can apply it to our lives personally. Okay, so as we look at this passage, and let me read verses 1 through 4 first and think about how sin affects us. It says this, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. Are you seeing this is a hard, hard thing, Okay. It is engraved on the tablet of their heart, the nation's heart, okay, is what it is, but, and on the horn of their altars. While their children remember their altars and their asherim beside every green tree and on the high hills and on the mountains in the open country, your wealth and all your treasures, I'll give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hands 
hand from your heritage that I gave to you, and I'll make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. For in my anger, a fire is kindled that shall burn forever. Who? Hard words. Super hard words. So what he's saying here is that the sin doesn't erase, at least not, not in our own strength. If you've ever done this uh, Bible study called Experiencing God, one of, the, one of the truths that they share, not the major truth, but it's the truth that sort of stuck out with me, is that disobedience to the Lord is costly. Obedience to the Lord is costly. When you follow the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's costly. It's the price to pay. But there's a bigger price to pay if you're disobedient. The cost of disobedience is way more uh, than the cost of obedience. And, and sin is costly and, and disobedience is costly. And so he talks about that verse 1. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron, with a point of diamond. So you see in how hard, the hardest of stones, you know, it's engraved on the tablet of the heart and on the horns of their altars. So there's a permanence to the nation's sin, okay? The sin was engraved. Now, have you ever thought about how deeply your sin and my sin affects other people? It's not only indelible, it accumulates, you know. Since the Garden of Eden, I mean, think about this. Since the Garden of Eden, we have been accumulating the effects of sin in our world since the very beginning. Think about that. The world is groaning under the weight of not only original sin, but the accumulated sins of people ever since then. Have you ever wondered why people... In the early chapters of Genesis, they lived to be 700, 800, 900, and 69 years old as Methuselah, and they lived that long. And why they don't live that long anymore? Well, in those early years, sin hadn't spread throughout, uh, throughout all creation. Really, sin hadn't had enough time to corrupt the DNA uh, of perfect bodies created by God. And so, so that, that residue of sin just accumulates and accumulates. So people started living shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter lives till, you know, if we live 80, 90, maybe 100 years, that's really good. But um, <clears throat> sin accumulates. And so since the Garden of Eden, DNA has been corrupted by sin, and it's been accumulated. So the consequences of sin actually have been adding up and adding up and adding up in creation ever since the Garden of Eden. Are you encouraged? Do you feel <laughs> you're not encouraged? Okay. Okay. So, and can I just say this very humbly? My sins, your pastor's sins, my sins, have added to that total. Boy, that's humbling to think that my sins have added to the accumulation of sin in this world. Your sins have added to the total effect of sinfulness in this world. You know, to me, that's very, very humbling because sin is engraved. It doesn't just erase itself, okay? And it's engraved into the nation's psyche. You know, do you ever think it seems like the world is more sinful than it used to be when I was growing up? Do you think that? Well, of course it is. I've been living here 58 years on this earth, and there's 58 more years of accumulated sin and accumulated consequences of sin in this world. Are you encouraged yet? Okay. Okay, <clears throat> do you feel uplifted yet? And we're all confused. We like to blame other people for why the world is, is going to, you know, where in a handbasket, right? We like to blame other people. But do you think about this? This world is groaning under the effects and consequences of accumulated sin ever since the Garden of Eden, and we're still adding to it. We're still polluting creation with sin. Okay. This is what Jeremiah is saying. And then in verse 2 and 3, he said, With their children, while their children remember their altars and their asherim. Now, altars, those are false god altars. This isn't the altar of Jerusalem. You know how I know? Because the altar in Jerusalem is singular. There was only one altar in Jerusalem. There weren't altars. You're talking about the altars to the Baals or the Baals, the Baals. 
uh, they were altars to the false gods. And then the Asherim, Asherim were poles. They were wooden poles. Or they might have even been big trees that they considered sacred. And they worshipped them, the goddess Asherah. And Asherah was the goddess of motherhood and fertility of the ancient Phoenicians in that area. And, and, and so get this. The children of Israel, the fond memories that those children had. You know, think about the fond memories, the stuff you want you, that you think is just great. Their fond memories of, hey, the family all got, and we did this, and we did this with our family, has such great memories of us doing, because what happens? They want the thing that they fond kids, that thing they fondly, we're engraving it into the memories, the fond memories of their kids, stuff, tough stuff, okay? Um, and so, while altars in their asherim, beside every green tree, and on the high hills, and on the mountains, in the open country, okay? Your wealth your wealth, uh, and all your treasures, I'll give, you as, I'll give for spoil as the price of your high places for sin throughout your territory. There were lots of these. They were throughout the territory. People of Israel hang out there, worship so much. The children just had all those great memories. People, brothers and sisters, we are hardwired for worship. We, are hard, we, we worship. That's what we do. God created us to worship. We worship. We worship every day. We worship. Now, we don't always worship God. Sometimes we worship things that are not God. But we're created to worship. If we're not worshiping God, we start worshiping other things. And, uh, you know, we're, we worship things like maybe food, chocolate, okay, travel, sports. How many times do I go to a funeral? And this is what they say about the person. He was a good man. He loved his family. And he loved the Gators. I mean, you know, worship sports, okay? Uh, your political party, whatever. You know, we're, we're getting ready to talk in Sunday. Not this Sunday. This Sunday we're talking about Laodicea, but next Sunday we're going to be talking about this amazing worship service in heaven that's going on right now. It's going on right now. And, and John had this glimpse of this amazing worship service. We're hardwired to worship. And if we don't worship the one true living God, what we do is we find other things to worship for. And that's what they had done. They had, they had substituted that. And they weren't only corrupting themselves. Their sin didn't just hurt themselves. It hurt the next generation that they were burning it into their hearts so they'd want to corrupt the next generation. So this is how insidious uh, the, the burning in of the sin uh, was going. So it was engraved, it was accumulating, and it was being ready for the next generation. That's why we as church, we need to break the cycle in any way we can. Break the cycle of sin. Break the cycle of worship and things other than God. That's why our four generations to come effort is so important. It's not about building a building. It's about reaching the next generation. It's more than just a building. It's, it's taking our faith, putting it into action, and reaching the next generation for Christ. We want the fun memories of their childhood not to be, not to be godless, but to be godly, right? That's what I want people to that's what I want people to have fond memories of. So let's move on here. I'm going at a snail's pace. I will have to pick up the pace. Verse 3. So he says, your wealth and uh, all your treasures I'll give for spoil is the price of your high places for sin throughout all your territory. You shall loosen your hand from your heritage. God gave them an inheritance, uh, the promised land, Jerusalem, all stuff. He said, that, that inheritance that you get to hold on to, uh, you're going to lose your grip. And you're going to lose all that, okay? And it says, I'll make you serve your enemies in a land that you do not know. 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came, Babylon came, conquered, and uh, they were gone. They, ser they were there serving their enemies over in Babylon. And for in my anger a fire is kindled, and you shall burn, and that shall burn forever. I guess the point is this. Think of the cost of sin. Think of the cost when you make a decision or when you live in sin, even just humbly, we all sin. But think about the fact that this doesn't just affect you. Sometimes we think that this, the only person that is hurting is me. We're adding to the worldwide debt of sin. Every sin that we commit. 
every every attitude of sin that we're in. So the sin is, sin is real important. It has an impact on my life, but it has an impact on my kids. It has an impact on this country. It has an impact on the world. Sin is serious. This is serious business here. Okay. Um, so let's let's move on here. We have a choice, and in in verses five. Uh, six and seven, eight, it gives us two choices here, okay? We like to have choices. Like if I were to ask you, what would you prefer, Coke or Pepsi? Anybody? Coke? Any Pepsis here? Okay, uh, chocolate or vanilla? How many would take vanilla? How many would take chocolate? Hey, Amen. I knew this is a good church. Oreo or chocolate chip in cookies? Oreo? Chocolate chip. What? Well, homemade chocolate chip. Oreos are only purchased, say so. Purchased Oreos, how many? Okay, homemade chocolate chip. Okay, okay. Uh, would you rather be cursed or would you rather be blessed? How many would you rather be cursed? How many of you would rather be blessed? Okay. He says, first of all, in verses 5 and 6, he talks Thus the Lord says, cursed is the man who trusts in man who makes flesh his strength. Okay? You're not only going to be whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert and shall not see any good come. Okay? He shall dwell in the salt land. And the key here is if you want to be, you know, how do you overcome sin? You don't overcome sin with a self-help book. You overcome sin with the Lord. The Lord is the one that gives us that strength. The weight of sin, the cost of sin, doesn't go away on my own strength. It only goes away when I turn to the Lord and I repent. That's why repenting is such a good thing. Repenting where we realize we're going in the wrong direction and we realize and say, hey, I'm going in the wrong direction. I'm going to go toward the Lord. That's a really, really, really good thing to do. And we need to start thinking that way. We need to start talking that way. That if, if we can help someone turn toward the Lord, it is one of the best things you can help them to do. It is the best thing you can help them to do. Turning to the Lord, okay? Because a heart that turns away from the Lord is cursed. And uh, how much good is going to be there? Nothing. It's an uninhabited salt land, okay? So that's how you're cursed. How do you become blessed? Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Cursed is the man who turns away from the Lord. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's not like a shrub in the desert, verse 8. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream. Does not fear when heat comes, because he's not going to be in a parched land. He's right there by the water. For its leaves remain green. It is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So not only is it not in uninhabitable land. If you're trusting the Lord, you're bearing fruit. You're not worried about anything because God is taking care of you. So that's, that's what he's talking about. This reminds me of Psalm 1. Many of you know Psalm 1? The, the, very reminiscent of Psalm 1. So it's those of you that know Psalm 1, you know, he's, uh, he is like a tree planted by rivers of water. So that, that's a beautiful thing. In the Bible, over and over and over again, it says basically there are two paths to take. A path to trust the Lord or a path to reject the Lord. It could be, uh, Jesus called it, you know, you can take the broad path that leads to destruction or the narrow path that leads to eternal life. Um, and you could be a John 3.16 Christian, a John 3.16 person who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ and because he believes he will have uh, life everlasting. Or you could be a John 3.18 person that says whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. So who are you going to be, a John 3.16 person who's going to believe and have eternal life or a John 3.18 person who's not going to believe and you're already cursed, you're already condemned already. So think about what choice are you going to make? John 3.16 or John 3.18? The broad path to destruction, the narrow path, the cursed person who's going to trust in their own strength or the blessed person who's going to trust in the strength of the Lord. And so those are the, those are the choices uh, that we have to make. And we, you know, we think we can make our own decisions, but then he goes on in verse 9 and says, but you know, we really can't even trust our own heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Are you encouraged yet? 
<laughs> tell you, this is Jeremiah. Jeremiah doesn't have encouraging words. He's the weeping prophet, okay? So, but he says, we, we can't even understand our own hearts. The heart's deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Well, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. You know, if you want to understand what's going on in your heart, let the Lord, you know, Lord, search me and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. You turn to the Lord to even understand our own hearts, okay? To give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Uh, there's only one person who knows your heart, and that's the Lord. You don't know your own heart. I don't know my own heart. As a matter of fact, there are ways, of, there are ways about me that I'm not as aware as my wife is more aware. Isn't that how it is? Worse than I Pardon? We have blind spots. Yeah, yeah. We have lots of them. Other people may be aware, and we're blind to them. But the Lord, with the Lord, there are no, there are no blind spots uh, with the Lord. Bless you. Uh, and then he says, so we're going we're to move on here, it says. And then verse 11 says, like the partridge that gathers a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches, but not by justice. In the midst of his days, they will leave him, and at his end, he'll be a fool. Common belief back then was that the partridge, we think this might be a partridge or a grouse or something. That's, it's translated partridge, but it might be a different kind of bird that, that would uh, take over the nest of another bird, hatch the eggs, but then as those birds grew up, they just sort of leave the mother bird. And, and, uh, and that's sort of what ill-gotten gain is. If you're planning on ill-gotten gain, um, it's not going to stick around with you. And then in verse 12, he says, A glorious throne set on high from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. This is talking about Jerusalem, the, the throne of God on earth, okay? He's saying there are people that were trusting in the fact that they weren't going to be destroyed. They weren't going to have to go into exile because there's a temple in Jerusalem. And as long as the temple is Jerusalem and God's presence is Jerusalem, then, then there's nothing that's going to be able to happen to Judah, and, and they're safe, okay? And so most of the scholars I've read are saying this is a reference to the temple in Jerusalem. But Jeremiah is saying this. Don't trust the temple to protect you. You know, there were three temples, right? There was Solomon's temple. You know what happened to it? They got destroyed. There's Zerubbabel's temple. You know what happened to it? It got torn down. Then there was Herod's temple. You know what happened to it? It got destroyed. And you know about the temple now? Oh, there isn't a temple now. So there isn't a temple going on now. You can't trust in the temple. The temple is not what's going to save them. It's not the temple. It's not the ritual. It's not the denomination you are a part of. It's not even your theology. You're not saved by your theology. I'm not saved by my theology, okay? What protects me is the Lord that my theology speaks of, okay? It's the Lord himself that saves me, and I need to trust in the Lord, over everything else. So um, he's saying it's the presence of the Lord that we need to deal with. So, and he, he brings it home here. He says, verse 13, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you shall be written in the earth, for they've forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. It's talking about being forsaken. It's talking about being put to shame. It's talking about being written in the earth. And uh, uh, it's sort of like a, in, a, in a graveyard where you have the, the tombstones and, and the people in the earth, but the, the gravestones have engraved their names on it. But there's hope in these words because it says the Lord's the hope of Israel, and he's the fountain of living water. So uh, there is hope for us, and it's all in the presence of the Lord. It's bringing that worship into his presence. And so uh, just the last part that I want to share is just verses 14 and 18. I want to move on here, and it says, uh, Jeremiah starts praying. He's, he's under a lot of criticism because the nation is strong at this point. There might be some threats, but he's telling them destruction is coming, and so he's getting a lot of bad press, and his poll numbers are not high. And so he says this, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. He said, oh, Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm telling people to look to you, and I'm looking to you. And then he complains to the Lord. He says, behold, they say to me, where's the word of the Lord? Let it come. And it's like people taunting him saying, hey, you should be giving us a word from the Lord, okay? <laughs> and Jeremiah's saying, but I, I have been giving you a word for the Lord. 
I have not run away from being your shepherd, nor have I desired the day of sickness. You know what came out of my lips. It was before your face. In the face, I did put the word Lord, but they're not recognizing it as a word of the Lord. Okay. Let those be put to shame who persecute me, but not let me be put to shame. Let them be dismayed, but let, not, let me not be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of disaster. Destroy them with double destruction. This is, the, this is the heartache that he's feeling. You know, sometimes when you're trying to do all you can in your power and you're trying to be whole and you see where everything else is going, it gives us frustration. And I know there are a lot of people frustrated when they see the world going in this way. Um, this is where I'm going to end in Jeremiah, but praise God, this is not the end of the story. This is not the end of the story. because I do want to take one other verse here. And the word is hope. And the word is hope. Praise God that our Bible does not end with the book of Jeremiah. It doesn't end with destruction, okay? Because what happened was a seismic shift happened when Jesus Christ came. And you know what happened? Light entered the world. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And there was a seismic change that happened. And the sin that could not be erased is now able to be uh, erased through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so let me just talk about that hope. I want to read as a benediction here. Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 and 27. Realize that even though everything is going wrong in this world, please know that there is hope because sin cannot be erased in our strength, but it is erased in the blood of Jesus Christ. And there are still consequences of sin in this world. But one day, he is coming again, right? Because I'm a Revelation 20 Christian. He is coming again, okay? And he's going to make everything new. And so all that stuff will eventually be erased. But until that time, Paul wrote this in Colossians 1.24. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. As you leave this place, you're going out in a mystery. You have got, you've got the magic recipe for erasing that dry erase board that sin put on with a Sharpie. And that is Jesus Christ. How that recipe works, I don't know all the details. It's the mystery of Christ in you. But you go out in hope. And you go out in the glory of his name. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you for giving us this time. Lord, we give it to you and send us out in your grace and peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for being here.